Welcome to the Pests and Pathogen section. My name's Dave Rizzo, I'm the first speaker. Technically, I was not the session moderator, but I became so about 30 seconds ago, because our session moderator is not here. Matteo Garbalotta, I think he had a family emergency, he's also the second speaker, so I get to introduce myself, and I get extra time. <laughs> so, there's trade-offs on some of these uh, different things. So back when uh, Matteo organized this session, he wanted to organize it around introduced or exotic plant pathogens in native ecosystems. And he assembled a series of different talks that you'll hear both now, it's got bright bulbs both now in the morning session and in the afternoon session. And he asked me to sort of get it started with just an overview talk looking at concepts and impacts of introduced plant pathogens. But I'll also throw a little bit about insects in as well. So this is meant really to set the stage for the remainder of the talks of this particular session and kind of give you a context for that. You can't give any talk on introduced plant pathogens without showing the slide of chestnut blight. This was sort of the, really the poster child for the first one that was truly recognized and has been studied the longest, at least here in North America. I think many of you are probably familiar with the story, chestnuts being the largest and most common hardwood tree in eastern North America that basically was reduced to a shrub. I don't have a pointer here, but the lower one, the introduction of Prypnectra parasitica, a canker fungus that killed almost every mature chestnut throughout their range. And I'll come back to chestnut blight as part of several examples. These are some of the examples that you'll hear about over the next few talks from various speakers. These are some introduced forest pathogens here in California, Porter for cedar root disease caused by Phycoptera lateralis in Northern California and Southern Oregon, white pine blister rust. sudden oak death, not as much as usual in one of these talks, I will talk a little bit about it. There are several other pathogens that I didn't have any cool pictures for. Keith is going to talk about a new fusarian species associated with polyphagous shot hole borer down in Southern California. There's a new Phytophthora, Phytophthora compeculata, that is causing problems in restoration areas. So these are a number of the different pathogens you will hear about. But this is an issue worldwide. This is a recent paper that attempted to add up a lot of the different exotic or introduced pathogens and insects in forest ecosystems around the world. The different colors represent the different forest biomes. So you see here 471 in the United States, 200 plus in Europe, and scattered numbers throughout the, the rest of the world. So this is a worldwide problem and it continues. This is a paper that looked at the United States and a number of introductions of insects and pathogens going back to the 1800s and you can see the steady increase particularly of insects in the blue and pathogens in the red. So this is a problem that continues on. Here's just sort of a conceptual way of thinking about invasions. This is obviously not unique to introduce pathogens or insects. Pretty much this stands for everything from invasive plants and invasive animals with starting with species and pathway, working through transportation, establishment, spread, and eventually impact. And 
15 minute talk, I can't really spend a lot of time on each of those, but now I've got a few extra minutes. I can <laughs> ramble on a little bit more, but I'm just gonna go through this and give you some examples and sort of set the stage for the talks that come after mine. These are generally some of the recognized pathways for introductions of both pathogens and insects. All of these are important pathways although the evidence, particularly recent evidence, suggests living plants are probably the most important pathway for moving pathogens and insects from one part of the world to another. This is a paper looking at introductions of forest pathogens into European forests over the last 100, 200 years or so. And you can see the steady increase of introductions in this bar here, these are living plants. Again, not to dismiss movement of wood, seed, and other pathways, but living plants do seem to be the most important. Here's a similar study for, done for the United States. Again, with the exception of wood and flow feeding insects, which I've said wood is a number one source of movement, living plants, again, are considered the most important pathways for a lot of these. And keep this in mind as you hear several of these other talks that come in after mine. Establishment and spread, there are many, many factors that go into this. When we think of establishment, there's things such as how much of the pathogen or insect, the numbers of individuals, the ecology of these different organisms as they potentially become established and then spread. There are many pathogens that can get established and not necessarily spread. One of the best examples is here in California. I don't know if there's anybody here from Modesto. There's Ceratosis distributata was introduced into Modesto I don't know, probably in the late 60s. It's killed just Battery sycamore or London plane tree in Modesto, but it's never gotten out of Modesto. And so this is one that it just kind of keep an eye on that it's become established but has not really spread. And we see this sort of pattern time and time again with a, oftentimes a longer lag period and then an exponential phase before the pathogen or the invasive organism becomes established. And I, you know, I don't have exact time to it because this lag period can last for a very short period of time in some organisms, but even decades with other organisms. <coughs> So as an example, I just want to show chestnut blight. And this is sort of a standard map we often see with chestnut blight, that chestnut blight was discovered in the Bronx Zoological Garden in 1904. And you can see these maps. The green here represents the natural range of chestnut. And you can see 1910, 1920, 1930, 1940 as the spread. And a lot of time that's taken to mean that this thing got established in the Bronx Zoological Garden and, and spread out there. But people began to dive into this more. The situation was a lot more complicated. And I think the evidence now suggests that chestnut blight had been introduced probably at least 20 or more years before and was already over a big hunk of the Northeast when it was discovered in the Bronx in 1904. Much of this was thought to have gone on Chinese chestnut plants through mail order that were then planted in a lot of the Northeast. So and in many cases, when they were attempting management in parts of Pennsylvania and New Jersey, the pathogen was already well past where they thought the line was. They just had not done the, the surveys there. But I think another thing that I really want to show, and chestnut blight's a great example, is no matter, in some cases, how even slow the spread is, it's often dramatically faster than other processes we see in natural ecosystems. So on the left here is the migration of chestnut to get to its native range over 13,000 years after the last glaciation to reach its present range about 2,000 years ago. Regardless of when you think it was introduced, it took less than 100 years for the pathogen to move through that entire range and basically take out all the adult chestnuts. How about an example from California? This is Southern Oak Phytophthora morum. 
The best evidence suggests it was introduced into Santa Cruz, probably in the late 1980s, early 1990s. The red dots represent its range in native ecosystems in California. We did a project several years ago attempting to model the spread of Phytophthora remorum, taking as much information that we knew at the time, and this is a work done by Ross Mintemeyer, who's now at NC State, and basically dividing California up into a series of grids, 250 meters by 250 meters, and tracking and estimating the potential spread, and this is just one particular run projecting out into the future. And you can see starting in the early 90s, as this potentially spreads throughout the susceptible range for the pathogen, it looks like run one more time all the way to 2030. So taking that grid, so the entire state of California on grids and looking at the potential habitat for the pathogen, this is where we're at right now in, in, in 2014, 2015. And we see the number of cells that have been occupied by the pathogen. And this is where it still has to go, thinking back to that graph that we showed, that we really have only touched a small part of the potential susceptible habitat for this pathogen. So that, when we think of management and the future, these are things to keep in mind. What about the impacts of these diseases? So we have impacts of plant pathogens. This is not necessarily associated directly with only exotic species. We can have impacts on individual trees, reduced growth, reduced fecundity, plant death. And this goes for insects as well as pathogens. But then we can scale this up to impacts on ecosystems, which over the years have received a little less attention than the impacts on individual trees, but we can look at their impacts on stand dynamics, on other ecosystem processes such as nutrient cycling, fire, associations with wildlife. That could be habitat creation here, but could also be habitat destruction as well. And so there are many potential sort of cascading impacts with these diseases. And I don't have time to really give a few examples here just to give a flavor. And so what I'd just like to return to is back to chestnut blight. So as I mentioned, chestnuts were a dominant keystone species in many parts of the eastern United States. And you know, these are seen from you know, parts of Pennsylvania and down through Virginia in the 1920s, 1930s. But I grew up in Pennsylvania, and this is what I saw. I mean, I didn't even realize that the largest hardwood tree in North America was gone from the forest near my house, probably until I was 20 years old or something, learned about it in a class. And so what we saw was a conversion of a lot of these forests to oak hickory forests, in some cases maple, different types of forests popped up. But then, as we start thinking over a longer term, other things began to happen. Gypsy moth was introduced near Boston actually probably several decades before chestnut blight was introduced. And if you think back in those days, much of New England was clear cut for farms, so we had land use changes, but also the conversion from chestnut to oak. Oak is a much more preferred food source for gypsy moth. And so what we see then, starting in the 1920s, as these forests started to change, started seeing huge outbreaks of gypsy moth. This then led to problems and with native insects and pathogens. And throughout the 20th century, there has been an issue with something that's often known as oak decline, where we had defoliation by gypsy moth, followed by borers, two-armed chestnut borer, Arnolaria root disease, hypoxia root canker. And in fact, as a person coming from the East Coast, and the first few times I actually saw sudden oak death, a lot of it seemed to tie into what I had seen on the East Coast with these large scale declines, mostly in mature trees, with native insects and pathogens that were linked to an exotic insect. 
Another good example, and you're going to hear about the impacts of this in California this afternoon, is Phytophthora cinnamomi. And another sort of one of the classic examples of issues with introduced species. This pathogen was probably introduced in the early 1900s in Australia. It has a huge host range. Anywhere from 900 to 1,200 different species are known to be susceptible. It's had significant impacts in the jar forest, eucalyptus forest in Western Australia, also in Victoria province, less so in some of the wetter areas. I had a great map on I thought I only had 15 minutes, I took it out. <laughs> Stick it back in. Here is an example. This is a root pathogen that moves through the soil. And with this particular plant, you can see a healthy plant, a dying plant, and a dead plant. And you can actually see sort of a line of death here. And it's the same thing with a sort of a swath of dead tree of dead plants here. So this is in forest lands, heathlands, shrublands, oftentimes converting entire forests to sedge. <laughs> and so you begin to see some regeneration here. There's an interesting study, and this might be too small for some of the, in the back, but I, because I took it right out of the article. In this particular paper, they looked at the impact of this pathogen on these native heathlands and woodlands, where you start with a native open forest or woodland or heathland, introduction of Phytophthora cinnamomi and dieback. The dieback is susceptible trees. But actually, down here, we begin to see the loss of susceptible plants and the decline of the pathogen and begin to have potential for regeneration. Now, in this graph here, what they've seen in Australia, it kind of goes two different directions. The climate remains somewhat warm and dry. You get regeneration of even susceptible species in the forest because the conditions aren't right for the pathogen and getting back to the original woodland. If the climate stays warm and wet, you start really seeing continued devastation. And in some cases, you basically, I mean, in this picture here, I mean, almost every plant species is dead. And you're gonna see some really interesting pictures of this pathogen this afternoon. In the case of Southern Oak Death, we see similar trade-offs with mortality of one species to the benefit of other species. Those of you not familiar with Southern Oak Death, it has a wide host range as well. However, the number of trees that actually die are primarily the oaks, red oak family, as well as canyon live oak, and tan oak, which is this picture here. But many other species are susceptible and don't die but these are the, often the hosts that transmit the pathogen. They laurel being the most common and most important. So you see these little lesions on leaves, but if we look in, these are the main dispersal propagules of the pathogen. And so what we can see over time is the decline of tan oak, and it's almost like the bay laurel, that's where the inoculum is coming from, and you see the climate can oak, the benefit of bay laurel, benefit of other host plants as well, depending on which ecosystem you are. So this is often called pathogen mediated competition. So we can see how over time these different ecosystems are changing. <coughs> the last examples I want to give are looking at some other ecosystem impacts. We've done a lot of work with sudden oak death and nutrient cycling, but the one I really want to talk about is fire. And you can see from the previous picture, you know, you have a lot of this dead tree, there's a lot of issues concerning fuels. And in 2008, in Big Sur, it was the first real fire, wildfire in an area that had a lot of sudden oak death. Big Sur was one of the most impacted areas. And so it gave an opportunity to look at how did the pathogen impact fire and how does fire impact the pathogen. So we have all these multiple feedback. And I just want to hit a couple of the highlights when we look at this that even before, even without sudden oak death, there's differential impacts of fire in these different ecosystems. 
And so when we look at something in a typical redwood forest down in Big Sur, tan oak is very susceptible to sudden oak death. It's also fairly susceptible to fire, and we saw sort of an additive effect of sites that have both sudden oak death and fire. Bay Laurel, there's no impact to sudden oak death only. Fire is quite susceptible, and again, we see sort of an additive effect. And these are what we would expect. The thing that really hit us was in the case of redwoods. Not susceptible to sudden oak death, or at least for mortality. Pretty resistant to fire, but what we saw when we had sudden oak death and fire on the same site, we had a dramatic increase in redwood mortality that was not expected. And a lot of this has to do, again, with fuel loading, but it also has to do with the stage of the disease. At early stages of the disease, you have standing dead trees with lots of brown leaves, not much on the ground. As we progress, we have a combination of standing dead trees and fuels, and then at the far end, we have just a lot of stuff on the ground with not many standing trees. And the upshot of this, without going into the details how we analyze them, is at sort of middle stages of the disease where we had still standing dead trees as well as lots of stuff on the ground, we saw a rather dramatic increase in mortality of fairly large redwoods. The biggest redwoods were fine. The smallest redwoods burned up regardless, but this middle set 40 centimeters, even up to as big as 80 centimeters saw a fair amount of mortality in these sites. All right, just a quick wrap up here. So this is our invasion process. We can give you some things to think about, particularly when it turns to policy and management options. And at each stage, we see things such as prevention at the early stages, early detection and eradication, control and slow the spread, and eventually we just have to adapt to the situation. And you'll see examples of pathogens and insects in each of these sort of stages through the next groups of talks. So keep these sorts of things in mind. The other thing I think is really important to keep in mind is the context. I mean, these pathogens and insects are not being introduced into pristine forest lands and ecosystems. And we have all sorts of other issues that are important for management. You can see that in all the different sessions around here. And I think this is something that's important. We've been discussing with Southern Oak Death for 15 years, how to put management in the context with all these other issues to our native ecosystems. So with that, I will stop and take questions. And so I went five minutes over my time, but I was able to talk slow. <laughs>